And of course, pray for our health. Uh, we're not getting any younger. Uh, pray for our financial needs, but pray for more laborers in the zone, uh, in that area, in the Metro Manila area. We could plant missions one a week if we wanted to, if we just had the funds and the people to work them. Um, but two, 20 million people, you're not going to reach them. Not in my lifetime. So we need the workers, the church planters, that we can train and to help them to reach their people. And the last slide simply is, most of you know this already, but we put it up there. <laughs> people ask us, how can we partner with you? Of course, you can mail it into the uh, BMA missions, designate our name, um, or you can go online, set up an account there with them, and you can do online giving as well. But we'll be here later if you have questions. So I'll be glad to talk with you uh, about anything. Um, we love to talk about the ministry. We cannot wait to get home. We're almost there. we got like a week, maybe a week and a half left, and we head back. Uh, people asked us when we got here, are you good to be home? I said, well, it's good to be here. We enjoy being here with our family and friends and sharing, but this is not home for us anymore. Philippines is home. God put us there. God put the burden in our heart there. And that is what we call home. So pray for us and pray for ministries. And we just thank you for this opportunity. Now let me just share a thought with you from God's word. Uh, as you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 1. This is a passage of scripture that as missionaries we have to hold fast to. We have to claim this quite a bit. And God has used this in many different ways uh, to teach us lessons. And... Um, it's very valuable. And we're all going to read like six verses out of this. So in James chapter 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 6. If you will please stand out of reverence to God's word. We begin with verse 1. It says, James, the servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect, and entire wanting nothing. If any of you like wisdom, let him ask God, that give it to all men liberally, and obeyeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Father, we just ask your blessings upon your word, blessed on these words that we speak, and Lord, that your will be done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. First of all, let me just say that background real quickly. James is written not to the lost, but to Christians. James wrote this to the church at this time. The church has been uh, going heavy persecution from Saul at this time. They're scattered throughout all over the world, fleeing for their lives. I mean, leaving homes, family, jobs, everything to have to flee for their lives for their own safety. And this is the letter James is writing to them. And, you know, the heart of the message here at the very beginning is saying, basically, count it all joy. You know, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the try of your faith worketh patience. Now, James is telling these people that had to leave, had to flee for life. He says, hey, basically saying, be happy. That don't sound like a good message to me. I mean, if I'm fleeing, leaving everything, trying to get to safety, and a pastor tells me, hey, be happy you get to do that. I'm like, what? Why? I mean, that don't sound right. I mean, you tell me to be happy because I had to lose everything, leave everything behind? But this is the message James is telling him. Why? Because those trials they're going through is for a purpose. The purpose is to strengthen their faith. The purpose is to produce patience in them. The purpose is to make them stronger and more steadfast and to be more like Christ. You know, and as Rita shared their testimony, you know, the purpose of her cancer was to not only to strengthen our faith, we see that now. If we would have acted negatively about it, like, why? Woe is me. Why? We're here. We gave up everything. We sold home, everything, car, possessions to come to the field to, to do your work, and you give her cancer. If we had that attitude, we would we have been home six years ago. But the fact that the Lord allowed us to see and trust 
that he had a purpose for what the cancer was, our faith began to grow even more. The assurance of the fact that we're doing what he called us to do grew even more. It's like the old shot in the arm, so to speak. You know, faith is like a muscle. You know, if you don't use your muscles, what happens to them? They get lethargic. They get like, oh, you know. You, if you sit on the bed for several months and you don't use your legs, you get up, you don't take off and start running. You jump and you, you, you wobble. They're not strong. So as you build your muscles through working by stress, by tearing them down, building them back up, the same way God works that way through the faith is that it comes through the trials that he allows or he causes in our life. You know, verse 4 tells us, is that let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. These trials are there for a time. It's simply to strengthen us to make us more like Christ. These words were meant for us today as it was meant for the church at that time. I don't think that we're facing the trials as the church did at that time. I mean, is anybody here here in the church in this area in the states other than the crazy people come in the church and try to shoot people are you you afraid that you're going to lose your life because you're a christian normally not but these people were running for the lives because saul was wreaking terror on everybody he, he was like causing so much terror now as you go through life as you have these things happen we have the choice to make we can think of the fact as, Lord, what are you trying to accomplish? What do you want to do? You know, there's an illustration I use all the time with this passage, and it really fits perfect. You ever heard the illustration about the silversmith? I'm sure you have. It's very popular. But if you was to ask a silversmith, you know, how do you refine silver? How do you make it pure? He would tell you that I would get the the pot of the, that the silver will be in, and I'll get the fire, I'll get it as hot as I can get it. I mean, it's got to be hot, hot. So I'm going to get the, the, the heat, as temperature as much as I can. And then I put the silver in the pot. And as the heat heats the pot, and the silver begins to melt, he sits there and he watches the silver. He watches the silver as it begins to melt. And as he watches it, the, some of the impurities begin to come to the top. They, rate, they separate from the silver. And he scrapes them off and throws it away. Now, the point is that he also, during this time when the silver's in the fire, he's got to sit there and watch it the whole time. He can't put the silver in the fire and go over here and make him a sandwich, you know, and come back 10 minutes later and check on it. He can't do that. He's got to watch it the entire time. And yet, why? Because he says, if I leave the silver in the heat too long, it becomes no good. It messes it up. It, it's good for nothing. So he has to watch it the whole time. And then you ask him, well, how do you know when the silver is ready? How do you know? He said, it's easy. So I can look down into the pot and I can see my reflection in the silver. Now you think about that and God puts us through the fire. When he puts us through the trials. He may put us in some of some very hot trials. I mean, to the heat is like unbearable. We think we just can't take it no more. But he's doing that for a purpose. It may be to remove impurities from our life, some sin that we need to get rid of, or maybe uh, something he's trying to help us to grow towards, whatever it may be. But whatever it is, understand that as we're going through that trial, he does not leave you. He's there with you the whole time. He's watching you. He's watching every step. He's seeing how you react. And he will not leave you in the fire no longer than it takes to accomplish this task. And remember, what the, how we know when the silver is ready is when the silversmith looks down and sees reflection. How do we know when we've been through the trial and we're ready to come out of it? It's when God can look down and see his reflection more in us than he did from the beginning. That he can see Christ in us more than he did in the beginning. Now, God's goal for us is to not make us happy all the time. His goal is to make us holy. And as Christians, we need to have the same goal. How many of us could say and pray this? I don't think I could. Lord, do whatever it takes to make me more like you. I want you to do with everything that you need to do in my life to make me more like you. I, that would be a very tough prayer to pray. Because how is he going to do it? By through trials, by removing things that uh, he doesn't like. 
And sometimes those trials can be very painful. You know, so that's what our prayer should be, but most of us cannot do that. I mean, think of Joseph. Think of Joseph. I mean, here's a man that, yes, he was a little spoiled, but he was sold into slavery, thrown into jail for a crime he didn't commit, and then stayed there longer than he was supposed to stay there. And the brothers, when they first saw him, they says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. He says, no, 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 no. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. God allowed these trials to go in his life to build him to the man that he needed to be for that particular time and purpose. If he didn't have the trials, if he didn't have the troubles, then he wouldn't have been the man he was at that time. You know, also Romans 8.28 tells us, And we know that all things work together for good, that love God, and to them who are called according to his purpose. You know, we always quote most of the time the first part. All things work together for good to love him. And that's true, it is. But we often live off the second part. And that's almost the most important part. For them who are called according to his purpose. We are all called for a purpose. Now we're called as foreign missionaries, yes. But you're called as missionaries here as well. You're a missionary in the community. You're a missionary in your work, in your school, in your family, in your neighborhood, wherever it may be. You are a missionary as well. And God has a purpose for you. And it's not to sit on the pew, as you mentioned this morning. It is to be out there to be a witness to other people, to share his message, to share his love to others. Not just words, but deeds, actions. Let them see Christ in you before they hear Christ from you. It makes a big difference. So we're all called for this purpose. Now, you know, verse 5 says, If you lack wisdom, let him ask God to give it to all men liberally, and pray if not, and it shall be given to him. We also take that verse out of context a lot. We also claim that, oh, if you need wisdom, just ask God and he'll give it. And that's true, he will. But in context, put it, see what James is saying to the church. If you don't understand why you're fleeing for your life, ask God and he will give you the reason why. He will tell you, he will reveal to you the reason why you're fleeing for your life. And I just spoil it. The reason why they were fleeing for the life is because they were disobeying. If you remember when Christ ascended, he said for them to, to go you therefore. Go make disciples. Go preach the word. What did the church do? They sat there in Jerusalem. They sat there. They was happy. They was comfortable. They were in a comfort zone. So God had to throw a pebble in the pond, so to speak, to start some ripples. That pebble was called Saul, and Saul began to persecute them and made them get out of the comfort zone, made them get out and leave to share the gospel to other places. But they had to find out the hard way. How many times do we have the calling on our life where God may be telling us to do something, but yet we sit there and say, I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with that. I can't do that. Let me just say, I, we, I wasn't comfortable when the Lord called me to ministry. I have a fear, fear of speaking in front of people. I'm scared to death now speaking to you. <laughs> I, I, I still, even to this day. And when the Lord called me to ministry full time, I, I laughed. I just laughed. I mean, verbally laughed out loud. I said, there's no way I can do that. And after finally when I surrendered, I said, Lord, okay, I'll do it. But you've got to do the speaking. You've got to give me the power to speak. And he's done so ever since. So whatever, if anything God is maybe leading your life to say, I want you to do this, don't waste time. Do it. Be the missionary that you should be here in our community as well. You know, and I will close with this. As trials come, as they persist, I mean, this happened back in 2014, 13, 14. But God had reminded us this past year as well. Like I said, this is very familiar for us and that we have to claim this all the time. We have two daughters and this past year both of them had things in their life that they really were had hard times with. And you know when they call you up on the phone and say, Dad, I wish you'd come home, but I just need a hug from you. I just I wish you were here. And it tears at your heart. I mean it just like in fact like it just, just ripped it out. And we prayed about it but God didn't give us peace about coming home. We wanted to. We wanted to jump on a plane and come back and just be there for them. <coughs> but God said no. We listened. I said, okay, okay, Lord. We trusted that God would take care of the situations. And God took care of the situations better than we could ever think about ourselves. 
And again, he just reminded us that I have control of your family. I have control of these things. Trust me. Trust me. Even though it's hard for you, I'm trying to teach you something still. Trust me that I have your family under control. I will watch over them. You do the work I've called you to do. Let me take care of your family. And through that, the Lord began to strengthen our faith again about trusting Him. That whatever the trial may be, whatever it may be that's going on, that He's in control. And He's not going to let it get worse than it, than it needs to be to accomplish His task. But your attitude, our attitude, will make a difference in the outcome of the trial, of the purpose. So, let's not have to be made to do something as the church did. But let us count it joy whenever God does a lot of things come in our life. Let us count it joy and be happy and look over the attitude. Okay, Lord, what are you trying to show me? Teach me. Show me. Give me wisdom. Because in verse 6 it says, But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that is wavered like a wave of the sand, driven by the wind and tossed. Whenever we go through these trials and these things in our lives, we need to say, Okay, God, why? And believe and trust and faith that he's going to tell you why. Because he's not going to put us through a lesson if he's not going to teach us through it. He wants to teach you. He wants you to ask. He wants you to ask that why. Why am I doing this? Why is this going on? And have faith and look and expect the answer to come. So let me just challenge you. As it says in James 1, 2, and 3. Consider a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Thank you, Pastor.